You're listening to the School of Hard Knock Knocks podcast with me, Maury Morgan. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, your next comedian. <laughs> Shouldn't drink on an empty head, you know that, don't you? <laughs> Everyone in this room is now dumber for having no. listened to it. What's a bucket list? <laughs> you have dangerously underprepared yourself for the shit that is about to get real. Greg Fleet is Australia's bad boy of comedy. On stage and off, Fleety has made a name for himself for pushing the boundaries and living life to its fullest. TV, movies, theatre, breakfast radio and 29 Melbourne International Comedy Festival shows later, it's hard to imagine how he had time for his now infamous drug addiction. But he did, because he's no ordinary comedian. Some might argue that in a sick way, this curse made him even funnier. Coincidentally, sick comedy also happens to be one of his fortes, as you'll learn from this episode. And just quickly, if you've been thinking of kickstarting a career in stand-up comedy, then be sure to visit the School of Hard Knock Knocks website and secure a spot in the next stand-up comedy course. There's still two spots remaining for the July 23-27 to 27 course with guest comedians Dave O'Neill and Mayumi Nabetsu. But be quick. And now, here's my in-depth interview with the NIDA-qualified, Daphne-killing, zombie-hunting, accidental comedian known as Greg Fleet. <laughs> Good morning, Greg. How are you? I'm very well indeed. How are you, Murray? I'm very good. Look, I know this interview needs to be sharp and, and short because you've got an important footy game to watch later on today. Well, I mean, possibly play. I'm still waiting for the call up. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm sort of on the uh, on the on the list at North Melbourne waiting to make my uh, my debut. So hopefully yeah. it'll be this week. I've been waiting for I don't know about forty years, but that's cool. You know, they yeah. they haven't said no yet. So you know, no, no. it's always right. possible. Yeah. Yeah, 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 persistence, very important. Well, it's a very long bench, isn't it? I think uh, you're on the bench, but it's somewhere near South Melbourne. Uh, yeah, yeah, it's long. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Excellent. All right. Well, well, Greg, thanks very much for this opportunity to t- talk about your life and the excitement that it is because we read about it. You've done just about everything. I, I, I think you have done everything. You've done TV, movies, theatre, books, Breakfast radio, although I, I believe that wasn't as successful as uh, as some of the other stuff you've done, and of course you've done stand up comedy. You've done it all. My question is: Was that intentional? Like, did you start off going, "I've got to do it all"? That's my life, my life's ambition, yeah. or did you just roll into the next by accident? Absolutely, just rolled rolled into the next thing. Like, very little of it was. Um was you know was ever planned or it's only it's only now really that I I I say to people if you know some comics or younger comics or whatever who's when I say younger I mean virtually everyone therefore <laughs> um, if they you know if they ask I say look it's a really good idea to have uh, especially I think in Australia to have numerous um, strings to yep. your bow if you possibly can or you don't necessarily need to I mean there are certain people who just you know um, you know Carl Barron for example or someone who is pretty much a straight ahead stand up and that's what he does and he doesn't really do much TV he just is a, you know goes around the country and doing stand up and does incredibly well so. he's writing a book though oh, is he? I've, I've spoken to his agents and yeah he's huh? very busy at the moment writing a book I'm not sure what it's what it's going to be called but, oh mm. good well there you go there's a uh, you know I, I think it is good idea you know if you can you know if you're interested in doing a bit of acting or writing or you know you get on radio or you know tv i mean depending on what you want to do i mean some people want to be a presenter some people want to be an actor you know um yeah yeah, look it's it's uh you know the only thing i have kind of generally consciously avoided is is being a presenter because i I enjoy acting stuff and I think if you get kind of seen as a presenter it might limit your chances to you know to be characters in shows because people will go no nah, that's you know that's the guy who hosts Australia's weirdest haircuts or whatever you know so, <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh, you know, so that's that's yeah. my only objective but I mean also with the um with some of the uh, the things I've done in in my life, I don't imagine there's a whole lot of commercial networks going. We want him to be the presenter. We want him to be the face of the network because the network would shut down quite quickly. I imagine. Yeah, right, right. Well, um, Shane Jacobson, I've been following his career because I I knew him at a very young age. He's he is getting onto TV yeah. like you're just you're just describing. He he was Kenny yeah. and now he's running a TV. He's running a show with kids. Oh, like one of those little, little yeah, big yeah, shots. Yeah. It's he's, called. He's actually good. Yeah, and he's good with kids. He's good at. He's one of those guys who's very good at um, 
at easing information out of kids that's funny, yeah. you know, getting kids to be funny and and because uh, he's yeah, but but he's also he did Australia's um uh what's the the car thing, whatever it's called, the one that was that Clarkson and oh, those guys did in the UK. Hot, yeah, he did Australia's top he he was the one of the three guys. He was like the Clarkson of Australia's top gear, which was a short yeah, run right. but but um they had they had a go on it. So yeah, he's a, a man of many talents and does musicals and does you know, he's he's kind of a raconteur. He's a bit of a stand up yeah. and a bit of an actor. Yeah, he's a he's a talented chap. Yeah, he is. He's and uh, I I can say that I actually acted with him back in the Scouts Boy Scout days. But that's another story. Wow, we're, we're, we're here wow. to talk about uh, Greg Fleet, of course. Now, talking about actors, you've got you've got a very uh, high caliber entry in your resume, and that's NIDA. Uh-huh. You started off, I believe, you're born in. Oh, sorry, you're born in the US actually, but but you grew up yeah. in Geelong. And then you got accepted to NIDA. Yeah, got got to, uh, you know, went to school here and um, and fell into acting at school. You know, wanted to be an actor. And in fact, I never wanted to be a comedian at all. No. I mean, I liked comedy. I liked, you know, um, I liked a lot of comedy on TV and stuff. But I, I never really watched a lot of stand up. I I didn't really. I mean, I kind of knew what stand up was, but I assumed it would be terrifying and and weird. But I, I liked uh, Monty Python and stuff like that. And yep. But yeah, I wanted to be a serious actor. I wanted to be, you know, like Robert du- Duval yeah. or Robert De Niro or someone. But so you became was... the Robert Downey Jr. To be honest, didn't you? <laughs> indeed, in more ways than one. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but um, but yeah, it kind of yeah went to NIDA, and that was fascinating. And 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 I didn't really think I'd get in either. I was kind of under the impression that you had to audition at least once before they took you, like, you know, audition mm. one year and if they liked you, they'd say, come back the next year and do it again. So I yeah. wasn't really terribly stressed about it because I just assumed it was a formality. And yeah. then they went, do you want to go? And I was like, oh, God, well, I, yeah, I guess. Like, you don't say no. So mm. I um, I did, and I was in the I was in the same year as Basil Lerman and um, wow. you know, a few people, and yeah, it was, it was, it was a great experience. Yeah. And so there you are. You're in you're in Sydney. I'm assuming at the time because a nighter was mm-hmm. only in Sydney at that time. And then it was '87, and someone, one of your mates, says you should try stand up. I believe. Yeah, it was actually no. I'd, I'd come back to Melbourne, and oh. uh, after NIDA, and some people I'd been at NIDA with were doing this thing called theatre sports, which was impro. Yeah. You know, and impro was the only thing at NIDA that I really struggled with. I just did not get it. I didn't know why people wanted me to be a fire hydrant or a you know a mouse <laughs> or whatever. And I was just like, I kept going, why? But why do you want me to do that? They just go, just do it. And I'd be like, nah, why? Mm. <laughs> and so weirdly. When they said you want to do theatre sports, I don't know why I said yes, but I did, and um, and found and just fell into it, and just went, oh, this is fun, and and I was also getting laughs from audiences because it yeah. wasn't a classroom environment anymore. It was like you know, lots of people, hundreds of people, and 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 I sort of went, oh, that's right, I was, I was kind of funny, and. And then through that, met a whole lot of stand-up comedians who were also doing theatre sports. We were kind of more like right. sucky actors, you know. And but there, you know, so we were all very proper and uh, doing warm-ups, and you know, and all these these comedians <laughs> are strolling and just smoking cigs and you know having whiskey and going on. And I was like, oh, that looks like fun. And and um, that was guys like Tim Smith and Andrew Goodwin and uh, yeah, and they they were like, you know, no, you know, you should do stand-up. And I was like, oh, I'd rather, I'd seriously rather shoot myself and do stand up. I, I just imagined it would be really confrontational and, you know, you'd have people screaming at you and yeah. you know, saying you're not funny and all that sort of stuff. And they kind of tricked me into doing it. Um ah. and and then they actually got me it was I was working at a nightclub and they used to come to the nightclub sometimes and one night um we were all uh, a bit worse for wear is probably the best the best way to describe it. I think the statute of limitations allow you to <laughs> tripping. Yeah, think it. We were tripping. Okay, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> um, and they said, Oh, you know, you should yeah, you're gonna do stand up and I was like, Yeah, of course, you know, and I was a little cocky and like, Yeah, I'd smash stand up and <laughs> and then they rang me like the day before the gig and said, Well you 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 know, you booked in for tomorrow night. I was like, What? No way. And they said, and they kind of fooled me because they said, it's too late. It's been advertised. And I, oh, I right. panicked and went, oh, then I have to do it. And in hindsight, knowing what I do about comedy now, who would have cared if yeah. the guy no one had ever heard of didn't turn up that night? You know? Yeah, right. So, but I did it and I really enjoyed it. And I went, oh, wow, this is fun. And, 
And uh, someone at the end of the night also gave me 40 bucks or something for doing Jesus. it. And I was like, oh, my God, like this is the best thing ever. And it meant, you know, suddenly I was getting paid to do this thing that was really enjoyable that was also performing. So it yeah. meant I didn't have to work in, you know, I was working in bars and restaurants and, you know, trying to make ends meet. And it meant that I could suddenly make a living from performing. So I kind of just fell into it. And, and very quickly, well, I've always done other bits of acting and other stuff. Comedy just took over, and it, it yep. became the main thing that I did. So, you know, and, and certainly how I, you know, if I had to say, you know, I guess at the end of my life, if I said, what have you done? I'd, I'd probably go to comedy because that's what I've done the most of. But um, it was never my intention. And I think in many ways it made it easier because I, I never, because it wasn't something I desperately had to succeed yep. at. It just, I, I had an ease about it, you know, and it, it went well. Well, that's that's amazing that your first gig, if I understand correctly, your first gig was also your first paid gig. Oh, I know. God, I, I, I feel, very much feel for people who are starting out in comedy now because, you know, yeah. I know people who are, you know, who are very good, who, who've done comedy for a couple of years and not ever been paid or, you know, maybe been paid yeah. once or something. And um, it's, uh, it was a very different thing back then. There was a lot less people. I think for the first year I yep. did it, there was myself and Rachel Berger and this double act called the empty pockets. One yep. of whom is now a judge on that, that, some one of those sort of brainiac shows. Um, but uh, we were the new comics for about a year. We were there was three of us, or four, you know, three acts, four people. One was a double act, um, yeah. and we were we got all the open opening spots. You know, like every show tended to have a a first spot, a second spot, and a headliner and an MC. And the first spot was you know usually someone relatively new, um, but everyone got paid so yeah and and for you know for the the first couple of years i did comedy um i was working probably on average four nights a week and Jeez. getting paid and so it was you know not only was i getting paid but more importantly i was getting to work most nights of the week and get better because of it you know because you constantly yeah. learn your trade yeah and and with a lot of you know new people now they're really lucky to work you know once a month sometimes, you know, or twice a month. And it's really hard to learn when you're not doing it that often yeah. because you, you know, you do it once and, and by the time they do it again, they've kind of forgotten everything they learned from the last time, you know, or, That's right. you know, whereas if you're doing it four nights in a row, you can do something and then your next night you go, right, I'm going to change that. And you, and you go, oh, that worked or that didn't work. So next yeah. night I'll do this. And, and it, it just rolls. You know, slowly. So we had it in many ways. We had it, um, we had it very easy. Yeah, right, right. Well, being on stage that often means that you have to write a lot of material. I'm, I'm assuming that you repeat it a lot as well. Oh, but yeah. where were you and, and where do you get your material from? Um, I very rarely write stand-up comedy. Like, I I, I, uh, I, I often, if I, I mean, I've done, like, God, 29 Melbourne comedy festivals or something, and every every one of those I'll write um, like a new show. Yep. So I do that. But as far as um, you know, week to week, getting around the place, I, I very rarely sit down in front of the computer and write jokes. I, I just find it if I try and do that, I find it's very forced, and I find it's not very natural for for the way I perform. But what I tend to do more than that is just walk around and see stuff and think, oh, that's a funny idea, or see a street sign or, yep. or hear someone say something weird and go, oh, and then I'll just think about it. And and usually, you know, I'll get to be on stage within a day or two of that happening and I'll just try it out. And if it works, I'll keep it. Mm. And if it doesn't, I'll just, yeah, throw it and pretend it never happened. But, um, you know, so most of my – most of my stuff comes from my own life, from things I've seen, things I've done, things that have happened to me, things people have said to me, you know, um, yeah, just day day to day stuff, you know, and and, uh, and you know, right. funny things I've seen, or or you know, just walking down the street. Mostly, it's it's that kind of it's observational, I guess, but um, but it's also personal yep. in that usually it's based in yep. something real that's happened to me. Well, I have to ask because you are talking about it. Would you be as funny if you didn't have that drug addiction. Uh, the calamities that that brought what came into your life, mm, they become um, part of your material, I assume. Uh, oh yeah, God, it's been a huge part of you know my material. In fact, you know, uh, I think last uh, this year's comedy festival show, um, 
which went very well, and I was really happy with them. I'm still doing some of the material from. Um, yep. And my partner said to me, she went, God, you know, this is the first show you've done in years that doesn't reference drug addiction. And I was like, oh, holy shit, that's, that's a good mm-hmm. point. Um, but look, I think I'd probably still be as funny, but it, it gave me a whole slant of, you know, a whole way of talking about something that um, most people probably hadn't experienced firsthand, but they had some, you know, everyone knows something about, you know, being stoned or drunk or out of it or right. addiction or, you know, whether it's addiction to gambling or eating or, you know, whatever addiction you addiction. So he gave yeah. me a, a thing to talk about, which, and it, and it gave me a kind of, for better or worse, gave me a, a persona as the, you know, the, the drug addict comic. I mean, I, I it's weird because I, I rarely, um, I never had a persona on stage of, you know, being, druggy, you know, being like, hey, man, I'm really out of it. It wasn't mm. that kind of thing, but it was more, you know, talking about some of the hair-raising things that have happened and and uh, and also that combination of kind of working at a fairly high end in performing or writing or whatever, you know, here and overseas, and but at the same time running a completely contrary double life where you're, you know, you're, you're working, working with the, you know, the sort of high end of of creativity, but at the same time, yeah. you know, running around in the in the in the the lower ends of society, you know, dealing with some dodgy people. But, but uh, look, I, I don't, I don't. It's a, it's a hard question to answer. But um, I'm certainly not suggesting comedians go out and take up an addiction just so they can become no, funnier. That's no, not, <laughs> not my intention. No, nah. We're not saying that, young people. But yeah. uh, look. Uh, you know, it, it is, it's a hard one to answer because you go, it's just what your life was. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's just it's just what my life was. So in some ways, I think I would have been probably more successful without it. Mm-hmm. But but then again, you know, some of the better things I've written and, you know, books or shows that I've written have been about that thing yeah. as well. So maybe I would have had less to talk about. Yeah, right. Um, Will Anderson was in the news for um, having a dispute, which apparently he was completely innocent for, on a Wagga Wagga bound airplane. Yeah. What I'm saying is bad news is good news in yeah. entertainment. So at least you became, you You were always relevant because people were hearing about you, oh, yeah. even if they weren't necessarily yeah. buying a ticket. <laughs> good thing. Yeah. Yeah, but look, and and um, one thing I will say is there's that old adage, comedy is tragedy plus time. Yeah, and that's, that's certainly right. true for me. I mean, it's to the point, you know, early on, you know, when something terrible would happen, it would take me a year or two after that to turn it into comedy. Mm. But now, if something bad is happening to me, even while it's happening, like, I, you know, this hasn't happened recently, to say I was breaking up with someone or mm-hmm. I was in a car accident or, or you know, um, you know, something, I was getting evicted or something like that. You know, 90% of me would be going, oh, my God, this is terrible. 10% of my brain would be going, this is going to be great material. <laughs> you know, it's really weird. It's like, you know, I can be, you know, I can be in a life-threatening situation and part of my brain is going, well, if you survived this, it's going to be a great 10 minutes. <laughs> 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 That's right. Every disaster becomes uh, a potential yeah. increase to your bank balance. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. And I'm sure Will will spin that into. You know, he's probably already doing it. He would have probably already started spinning that thing into into material. And you know, good on him. Well, it's certainly good for Wagga Wagga because we now know it has an airport. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. And. Yeah. Uh, right. yeah. Cutting yeah. p- marketing strategy on behalf of Wagga Wagga Tourism Board. Yeah. <laughs> well, um, you do. Yep. I want to go a little bit dark. Uh, not not in the the heroin or the the drug thing, but I want to talk about some of your comedy because mm-hmm. uh, I think one of the first uh, sets I ever saw you, and I can't look. I can't recall whether I was sitting in the audience or if it was on TV. But you, I suspect it was. Uh, I was in the audience, and you you came up. Uh, you were introduced. You came up. The first thing that came out of your mouth was. Um, so my my sister just died. There was silence across the room. <laughs> yes, it would be. And then you tap the microphone. <laughs> you tap the microphone, and you, and you kind of look puzzled. Sorry, is this on? Hello? Now, I lost it. Oh, I lost right, it at right, that yeah. point. But the problem was I lost it about two seconds earlier than everybody else in that room. Yeah. It was a very dark joke, but I was the first one to laugh at it, which made it me feel <laughs> even darker. <laughs> Oh, well, that's good because it probably made other people feel that they could laugh once you'd laughed. You'd broken the ice, thank God for you. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah. that's right. I think we have we share the twisted mind. You're quite famous for 
for being able to, and I've spoken to comedians, I was t- talking to Chris Franklin actually about you and the way that you just throw in the most um, despicable and, uh, <laughs> you know, you know, you've sometimes mentioned pedophilia up on stage yeah. like, a, like, you know, like a, um, a segue into yeah. another joke and, yeah. and everyone's gone, yeah, yeah, that, that, that's, that makes sense and only five <laughs> seconds, ten seconds later they've gone, hang on, what did they say? <laughs> yeah. And hopefully How? by then you've moved on and they're like, ah, oh, they, I probably yeah, misheard no. them. <laughs> but no, I, I, I enjoy that because I enjoy seeing that myself, you know, like, um, and, you know, sometimes I really get it wrong too. Like, you know, sometimes I, I'll, just, I'll think, oh, this is hilarious. And I'll say it and it'll just be the audience is to be like, no, nah, no, that's not on. And I'll be like, oh, okay. But I love seeing comics do that kind of stuff, you know, go to weird, weird places and, and you know, and and often dark places. Yeah. As long as they get out of it, you know, as long as it's not just you know just taking people into depression and then leaving them there. But um, it's kind of a thrill too to to do that. You know, uh, you know whether it's you know I often do things about my parents dying or about yeah. disease or or death or you know. And if you try explaining it to someone, like sometimes when people go, "Can you write your material out? If we're going to do it." said on TV and you'd write it out and you go, this just reads <laughs> terribly. It just reads like the most depressing, you know, but, but, uh, it's stuff I, I really, I find laughing about really dark stuff yeah. is, is cathartic and, and good. And, you know, I, the one thing I, I generally, for all of the, you know, I will, I will go to dark places in stand up, but I really try not to make a group or an yeah. individual, the victim of my comedy, you know, like I'll talk about myself and I'll talk about, you know, I'll paint myself as being a weirdo or, or you know, like or I'll, I'll laugh about death or disease or whatever, but I don't laugh about right. someone who has that disease. I don't laugh about, you know, but you know, it, it can, you know, sometimes I'll, I'll do stuff like that. And, you know, it can be a trick because, in you know in a in a kind of cool inner city comedy club where people are really used to watching comedy and maybe they know you and stuff and they they'll go with you on that stuff and they'll go oh yeah that's, you know, yeah clearly does that it's really cool but then I'll take that to another gig you know I'll take that to a you know a corporate gig or or a, you know a gig just somewhere else where people just yeah you know, and for all I know maybe someone in that community has yeah. died of cancer or maybe someone's, you know, something's happened that I don't know about and I bring up this thing and I think it's hilarious because, and, and I also think, oh, you know, stay with me because I'm about to get to the funny bit, but people are yeah. just like, no, mate, no, no, that's not on. And you, you never get to the funny bit. And you just seem <laughs> yeah. like a total asshole. So it's a, it's a, it's a, Slippery slope, you know. I can understand why a lot of comics don't do it. <laughs> yeah, I guess some um, self-selection is part of comedy. Once you get a name like you're, like you're a famous name in the comedy mm. circuit, people who buy your tickets know what to expect. They self-select to the comedy level. But you're right in that corporate environment where no one has the audience hasn't necessarily bought the ticket. Nor yeah. the, maybe some of them don't even know who you are. Absolutely, and and they often they often they don't. Yeah, you know, or, they, or they'll they'll vaguely recognise you, but they haven't watched you material. The other thing that can be dangerous, I, I would say, for corporate gigs, you know, my hit miss ratio is probably fifty fifty. Or mm. you know, like okay. I've had some horrific gigs at corporate gigs. But quite often, what happens is someone will ring you up and go, "Hey, we want to book you for this." you know, event or this corporate thing and pays really well. And, you know, we, you know, I, I love you. I think, you know, you're, you're, I've seen all your comedy festivals, you know, you know, you're a great comic. And you go, oh, cool. So you go, oh, this would be great. And then you get there and you walk in and you suddenly, I, I can tell as soon as I walk in the room, I go, oh, this isn't right. Yeah. And then I realize, oh, hang on. The person who's booking this gig loves me. And no one else in this room does. Yeah. You know, you go, all oh, right, you're the weirdo in the office. who just happens to love stand up comedy. No one else here likes stand up comedy and they're certainly if they if they do like stand up comedy, they're not gonna like my version of it, you know. And and sometimes I'm wrong, sometimes they really enjoy it. But and you know, I've had some great corporate gigs and stuff too, but sometimes you, you go yeah, it, it's set up on the wrong premise. Like yeah. they'll go, you know, I love you, you're great and you go, Oh, cool, this is, and you and when they say that, you read that or you hear that as everyone that's gonna be there loves you and thinks you're great. Yeah. Rather than oh, it's a whole lot of school bursars called, you know, financial controllers for primary school. Yeah. 
you know, they don't really even want to see stand-up comedy. Even if they do, they want it to be fairly gentle and innocuous. They don't want to be confronted by someone on an existential death trip or something, you know. So, um, yeah. yeah, it can be it can be very hard to predict. Which makes it so surprising that you decided to do the zombie flick, Me and My Mates <laughs> versus the Zombie Apocalypse. When I heard that you were starring in this uh, slapstick, to be honest, you know, slapstick comedy... <laughs> Um, I was yeah. like, this this is not the Greg Fleet that I know of. What? So for those of you, those of the people in the audience who don't know that you've starred in this zombie flick, a comedy zombie <laughs> go flick, see go yeah. see it. Tell us a bit about um, why on earth you decided. I mean, it's good names. Jim Jeffries, of course, is, is mm. one of the ma- main guys mm. and Alex uh, yeah, Williamson Alex Williams and, yeah. uh, in there as well. Yeah. What on earth made you say, yeah, that sounds like a great idea? Um, it was probably mostly, and, I, and even though it was, you know, it's a kind of low budget, Aussie horror film and you know with all that entails you know um, there are some great scenes in it and some great there's even some really moving bits in it and, and you know but you know okay. it's, a, it's yeah. a you know it's a kind of light zombie film but um, uh, it's probably because the way it was put together my then manager Andrew Taylor uh, also mm-hmm. manages Alex and Jim Jeffries well Jim right. Jim's stuff in Australia anyway and um he he said, you know, look, these guys want you to do this film. And I probably would have said yes anyway. But but then the fact that those mm-hmm. guys were involved in it, uh, yeah. you know, I kind of went, oh, this will be fun. And, and it was, you know, usually in films or, or TV dramas or whatever, if I'm in them, I have a, you know, I'm quite often have a decent role, but it's, it's not like a big, big, big role. It's, you know, it might be like 10 scenes or something, but this I was in all the time and all the way through, and it was kind of like the co-lead, and it was like, I just thought, oh, yeah, and, and it was um, it was a great idea, the, the idea for the story, and, and they let us rewrite a lot of, Alex and I rewrote a lot of the dialogue, because it was a bit stilted, it was a little bit, yeah. it was a bit, you know, sort of like people going, oh, Stone the Crows, what's going on there? And so we just made it the way we would talk, right. you know, and because we yeah. did that, then we found it really easy to deliver, because it was it was in our voices. So it was, um, yeah, it was just a bit of fun, but it, um, yeah, I was kind of, you know, pleased with the way it came together, and it's, uh, you know, it's certainly not in my top ten films of all time. But, uh, but um, they didn't dress up as zombie as Daphne from Neighbours, did they? Oh, Just for like have. an insider joke. That would have been great. They should have, because <laughs> again, for those who don't know, yeah, your character, who I don't know the name of your character, but in a car crash, killed Daphne. Is that right? Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah, in Neighbours, in uh, in the back in the the. the um, in fact, so it killed Daphne, drove her off the road and killed her, and then yep. uh, in true one-dimensional Aussie TV style, came back to the town and taunted everyone. Like, rather than just <laughs> lying low and going, oh, we got away with that, came back and caused trouble and, you know, like yelled out at her grieving husband and baby and stuff, you know, it's just one-dimensional bad guys. And... um and then got into a fight with most of the cast of Neighbours, which was pretty cool. Um, but I, at one stage I had Kylie Minogue punching me <laughs> and Jason Donovan, I, and I was punching Jason Donovan. <laughs> and uh, in the end it was uh, Guy Pearce came to the rescue because he did, apparently he was his character did karate. Oh. So he came in and kicked us and bashed us and we were done. But um, we got off in court too. So oh, he did? Like, yeah, we got off, which was, you know, heartbreaking for fans of Neighbours. But I'd always said to people, if you're going to be in a show as terrible as Neighbours, you should at least kill one of the main characters <laughs> Yeah, you know, for I, the people. I'm surprised that's not on your business card. <laughs> no, not many people have that claim to fame. But also, Daphne didn't come back to life again later, like a lot of Neighbours cast that die. They always... I know. I think she really definitely, I think she honestly, when, when like, a weird thing about that is I went to, not long after I'd done that, um, it was the first time I went to the UK, and mm. it, you know, not really understanding how big Neighbours was in the UK. I was, you know, walking down. They ended up using it as a publicity thing and to get people to yeah. the show because I liked it. But, yeah. but I remember walking down the street in London, and this guy just came up to me and said, "What'd you do it for, man? What'd you do yeah. it for?" And I'm like, "What the hell? This guy thinks I've just robbed a shot or something, you know?" And um, yeah. and it was that he was really quite angry. And for a minute, I thought he was going to punch me. He was angry because I killed well, Daphne. And I sort of had to turn and explain to her. I think she was, didn't want to do the show anymore, and that confused him no end. You know, like 
Yeah. yeah. The cast aren't on ad lib, right? They don't they don't just ad lib the whole episode, yeah. right? Yeah. Oh, I'm just going to kill a character now. Yeah. Just a group of people who happen to live on those streets <laughs> and they just film. It's a docker. <laughs> Oh, I used to live around there actually because it's filmed in Nutter Wadding. I used to live in the next suburb over. So, um, yeah. to be fair, it, I, it, we did live like that. It was, um... <laughs> Oh. Uh, well, fantastic. Well, now g- getting back into comedy, and the people that listen to this podcast are, are newbies. They're, you know, some of them have actually done lots and lots of open mic gigs. They're just not getting traction, or they're newbies just thinking of getting started in the industry. What's some of the advice you'd give to those people who today in Australia, obviously very different than when you started, yeah, yeah. but you'd know what the scene's like Yeah, still. yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I do a lot of, um, I do and have done, you know, kind of since, almost since the beginning really, I've always kind of done quite a few open mic gigs and kind of kept in touch to some degree with, with you know, a lot of the new people coming through. And I do, do a few workshops and stuff, especially if I'm into state, like, you know, doing gigs in Adelaide or Brisbane or Perth or something. I did the same thing in Alice Springs, you know, the, the local community or the people, you know, who it's, those gigs are usually run by, you know, people in the industry and they'll say, oh, do you want to do a, a workshop? Yeah. Or you're like, oh, yeah, why not? But um, the thing I say to people is, oh, there's a whole lot of things. Um, the one thing is do it as much as you possibly can. Do you know as many gigs you can, and even any gigs really. You know, if you're starting out, it doesn't. They don't have to all be you know streamlined, you know, amazing gigs. Like you, I think you learn a lot more from a bad gig than you do from a good gig. I certainly yeah. do. Like I still have bad gigs. I think all. Well, I don't know if all comics do. I mean, no. In fact, not all comics do, but I do every now and then. I get too cocky or get lazy, and and then have a bit of a tough gig, and then. You know, the next few after that are always really supreme because I'm really focused. And mm. but um, I'd yeah. say you know do as many as you can. Um, and there's there's a whole lot of uh, like one one thing I'd definitely say to people is if you're really nervous or you're really stressed or really tense, which is quite normal, um, either hide it or acknowledge it because there, there's yeah. very like when I'm watching a comic, you know, even as long as I've done comedy, I can watch a, a comic on stage. And if they're really stressed, my hands go to my throat, literally physically. I, I start grabbing myself because I feel for them. And it's, it makes me really uncomfortable to watch someone being really uncomfortable because I feel, I feel terrible for them. And I think audiences are like that. You know, most audiences don't want to see you do badly. Yeah. They want to see you do well. And, if you're also really stressing yeah. out, it stresses them out. Whereas if you're having a really good time, they'll have a really good time. So yeah, right. what I found, what I used to do was either, either I, I got to a point where I could, if I was really stressed, I could act like I wasn't, which is was a good thing. But the other thing that I, I would say to people and I used to do myself yeah. is yeah. just acknowledge it. Just go, oh, I'm really nervous. And the it takes the edge off it. it yeah. re, the audience goes, oh, of course you are. Like, of course you really know. You've done this three times, like or ten times or whatever, you know. Mm. And and then then they yeah. you know, they kind of feel like you've you've shown them a truth about yourself and they, they feel connected to you and it's a yeah. it's a good thing. Um well, it certainly works for Luke McGregor, the Tasmanian yeah, comedian, absolutely. doesn't he? He's, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. He's he's very and that's almost his shtick now, you know. He's, yeah. He's you know, is that um a couple of things I got told when I first started, which was the one bit of advice I remember very clearly coming from uh, coming from a couple of people, uh, the fabulous Russell Gilbert and mm-hmm. the the wonderful Trevor Marmalade. I remember them both saying they were kind of like the, the you know, the, the experienced guys when we started. And they'd probably yep. been doing it for a couple of years longer than us, but, you know, mm-hmm. they, they knew what they were doing. And uh, and Glenn Robbins and guys like that, but they used to say, start with your second best thing yep. and end with your best thing. Yeah, yeah. And that, it's not a, it's not necessarily something I apply all the time now, but it's such great advice when you're starting out because, you know, if you've got if you start with your second best thing, it's usually going to be pretty good, and people yep. go, oh, this is pretty good. And then if you end with something even better than that, they're going to go, oh my god, that's even better. And it's almost like anything that happens in between those two things. 
is kind of irrelevant, you know, like mm-hmm. as long as it doesn't go for 40 minutes. But most people in you know, starting comedy are only doing five minutes anyway. So yeah, yeah. Um, it's a really great theory uh, yeah. on, you know, if you're starting out. But the other thing I'd say is hang out with comics. We used to, we lived in each other's pockets. And I mean, mm. as we got older and people started having families and getting other interests and, and um, things like that, we kind of drifted a bit. I mean, I still hang out with, a few comics. I've got a couple of comics coming over for dinner tonight. But yep. you know, I don't. I don't. I used to live and breathe comedy. You know, we all hung out together. We all lived in the same suburbs. We all had breakfast together, had coffee, and did gigs together, and you know, talked about comedy. And that's a really good thing to do. You know, it's a really because it's a community, and and your contemporaries yep. are the next generation of you know comedy, and and. Uh, so hanging out with those people and, and spending a lot of time talking about it, even putting on your own nights. You know, if there's not enough work, put on your own night. And it doesn't even have yep. to be in front of an audience. You know, if there's, if you've got like 10 comics who are all starting at around the same time, you're all friends, find a place, you know, be it a church hall, be it a, a comedy venue that's dark that night or whatever, do shows for each other. You know, yep. and get feedback from each other. Just just work, you know, work as yep. much as you can. Oh, that's good. That's good advice. Well, at the moment, if people want to see you on stage or meet you in person or watch you on stage, because you do theatre as well, what do you what have you got on the plate? How do we uh, how do we yeah. get to see more of Greg or Fleety? Um, uh, well, I always do festivals, and and you know, I'm usually um, you know running around the country doing. Doing his, uh, did you hear? The, can you hear that noise? Oh, oh I was like, did a you just hear that sound? sounds? Yeah, that was actually my, the app on my phone going in about fifteen minutes of the football. So it was like a football sign. <laughs> oh, it okay. goes off. <laughs> that was beautiful. Nice. But um, <laughs> um, I'll get to watch North Melbourne get smashed yet again. Um, but uh, look, you know, I'm, I'm quite often, you know, when I'm in Melbourne, working around Melbourne, you know, doing the you know, the Comics Lounge or the, you know, Carl Chandler's gigs around town, the the, the European and the Spleen yep. and all those kind of gigs. Um, yep. uh, I'm writing a book at the moment for Penguin, yes. like the second, another book. This one's a novel, so uh, it's a bit less self-obsessed. Um, and um, our play, one of these, I wrote a, a, an adaptation of Macbeth set in Australian politics, which okay, great. Uh, has just been... It did did well in Adelaide and Perth, and it's just been accepted at the Brisbane Arts Festival. So we're going up to do that in September. And um, but look, you know, I'm always around it, at gigs all around the country. You know, I, I spend kind of three months in Perth, three months in Melbourne, three months in Perth, three months in Melbourne. But yeah. you know, like I'm going to New Zealand on Tuesday for a week to do gigs over there. I've just been in Adelaide doing gigs. I've just been in Queensland. So I'm always jumping around the country, and okay. um, you know, just look at a gig guide or whatever. But if you want to contact me. I'd, I reckon the easiest way is just is Greg Fleet on Facebook. Yep. Just send me a message on Facebook, and uh, and um, yeah, I, I I look at that stuff daily. So you know, it's not like it, it won't be sitting there for weeks without an answer. Oh, perfect, perfect. So if someone's out there looking uh, to cast another actor in a zombie movie, or they've got a character Ooh. that needs to be Ooh. killed off in a TV show, uh, Facebook. Yep. Excellent. <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, it's. Um, a f- hilarious history of if you want to be successful live with me for a while because I've lived with Ben Mendelsohn <laughs> I've lived with Simon yes. Pegg and Nick Frost I've lived with Stuart oh, wow. Lee I, um, it, yeah, it seems to be if you live with Greek Fleet you, you have an international career perfect uh, of course I don't necessarily but that's not my job my job is to just you know I, I'm a, a gateway I'm a gateway for me you're the, uh, the John the Baptist <laughs> you're John the Baptist of uh, Christianity exactly yeah. I didn't <laughs> I didn't want to give yeah. myself a biblical title, but you're quite right. That is who I am, yes. That's fair enough. <laughs> yeah. Well, mate, thanks very much, uh, Fleety, for your time. Um, uh, thanks, you've man. really gone into some depth. This has been a, a lovely chat, and I've learned some things as well. Oh, thank you very much. And I really like what you're, uh, you know, what you're doing. It's a, it's a as I said, I, I listened to... Um, to Tim, yeah, Tim Ferguson, Tim from the D- Doug Anthony's, and uh, yeah, who's, who you know has now found another uh, you know kind of career as a well, educator, I guess in a way. Yeah, he is. Um, mm. But um, you know, it, it was it was a great thing to listen to, and it certainly helped me to do this. So anyone that asks me, I'll um, I'll highly recommend they do it because it's um, you know you, you're good at what you do. Perfect. Well, I won't keep you any longer because I know the the Kangas are going to start the game. Yeah, they'll start the game. They usually start well, and then it's a slow, horrific 
plunge into into <laughs> into depression. Yeah, but, uh, exactly. You, can, you can't be more <laughs> um, um, shit. Is what you're going to say. You're gonna, they can't be more shit than they are now. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> <Shit>. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> they can't be more shit. Yeah. Disappointed. I was going to say you can't be more disappointed at this point. Beautiful. Well, cheers, Greg. Thanks for your time. Thank you very much, Mario. It was really enjoyable, and uh, and keep it up. So there should be more of it. Thanks again.